Hey, you made it. Hello, I did. How are you? I'm good. You got like a fancy background today. That's kind of cool. Yes, I do. I have my little Escania and background in the back. Cool. So um, uh, we were talking a little bit yesterday. That yesterday was the first time we had met. Yes, it is. That was all I had. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so I guess we, we start all this stuff with, um, uh-oh, you're on your side now. There you go. You're back. <laughs> um, I could do it too, and then we could both. Uh, That's okay. We'll play. I was playing with it. So you, we were talking yesterday that you are our first guest from Haiti. Yes. Our second guest from outside of the United States. We went all the way to Australia. So you're not even the first island. Really? You're, okay. You're the second island. That's fine. That's fine. So, that is not a problem. But, um, and you're our first true bean to bar manufacturer on Chocolatier Chat. So, okay. Pretty cool. So, we've talked with a bunch of confectioners. And, and who did you talk to from California? By and Cole? Uh, we've talked to lots of people from California. Oh, you know what we did? We I talked mean, to, to Australia. Um, Drew Madison. Okay. But, and you actually, technically, you're a second bean to bar because we talked to Cho. From California. Yes, I remember we said that. Yes, okay, that's fine. I mean, there's a lot of bean to bar. It's a, I mean, there's about 250 in the US, another 200 in Europe. So it's a big field. It's just that it doesn't usually happen at Origin. But only so one in that's Haiti. Where. Well, there's another one who started after us. We made a call, as we say in French. So yeah, we're great. It's more opportunity for the farmers. How I see it, it is more opportunity, more bean to bar. It's more opportunity for the farmers because we. The, we not only have the chocolate company, we're also vertically integrated. And this is part of me being an engineer, you know, so making things more efficient. So we started sourcing the bean directly from the farmers. Right. And, and we ferment and dry. So we have our own fermentation and our own drying center. And we use some of the bean for ourselves. And the remaining, we've been selling it in the U.S. and in Canada. Oh, great. You probably know Monarch chocolate in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the alchemist in Eugene, Oregon, right. he buys some of our beans, and the rest we use for Scania. So, how I see it is the more beans we sell, the better it is for the farmers. Right. And if there's another, if, and if we have other chocolates here in Haiti, that's great, too. Cool. So, let's rewind a scooch, and we'll get into sort of the whole okay. story. <laughs> but you were telling me, so you are Haitian, we're born in Haiti. Grew up Actually, in Haiti? I wasn't. Oh, um, So I'm Haitian, definitely in the way, but in the mid 80s or in the 80s, things were starting to go negative in Haiti, if I could put it say, or sour. So middle class people will come to the US and deliver their babies. So I'm one of these babies. My mom came before and she had me and she went back to Haiti. So technically I have my US passport. And that was kind of kind of like a, like kind of the way to get your paper. Oh, to get out if there's an issue. Anyway, so I grew up in Haiti all the way to high school. Um, and then I came back here for college. And in between, I met my husband, who is German. And we decided to, okay, we're going to stay halfway between Germany and Haiti. And I ended up being New York. Okay. But at some point, I, before we got married, I did tell him, you know, uh, I want to go and have business in Haiti. And yeah, so that was the deal we made. Um, so where'd you, so go, to, where'd you point, go to school though? Where, where'd you end up going? To I went to University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Go Blue. And go Wolverines. For my engineering. Yes, I hope you're not from Ohio State. <laughs> well, I'm a little mixed up. I got to be honest with you. So I, okay. I grew up in Pennsylvania and my father went to Penn State, which wasn't a big deal okay. about that whole thing until later. And then my stepfather went to Michigan. So okay, that's it was that, and then I lived in Madison for a while. So I'm a, oh my God. I'm a little confused. I'm a little bit of a Badger fan. I'm a little bit of a Wolverine fan. I'll root for state here. And it depends. It depends who's playing. It depends. That's okay. That's so okay. as long, I mean, as, long as any a... of them beat Ohio State, I'm good. Like, cause I'm not, I'm okay, not an Ohio that, State. That's good. That, 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 then we can talk. We so can talk. That's when, no problem. When were, when were you in Michigan? So when were you in Ann Arbor? So I was in Michigan. I was, I graduated in 2006. Yes. So I was there up to the four years before. But, I mean, how I got into chocolate is, and why, I would say, well, let's say, growing up in Haiti, like, my family was middle class. I had a beautiful upbringing with all the family, the grandparents, the uncle and the aunt. But I was aware of the poverty surrounding us. So I was aware that we had to help the housekeeping staff. 
when there was an issue with health or with kids back to school times, so I decided, you know what, when I go up, I'm just not going to do charity. I'm going to create a business. So the business ended up being Ascania. What was your degree in, though, in school? Engineering, industrial engineer. Okay. So I'm a Michigan engineer. So I kind of know how to run things efficiently, which is kind of helpful in Haiti, where there's a lot of issue with uh challenges with many things um whether it's infrastructure with production and all so that comes pretty handy but all of your ingredients are haitian right i think right so all your all your yes. cacao is haitian all your sugar is haitian all my cacao is haitian all my brown sugar is haitian all my lime is haitian the only two things that we don't have that is haitian is first our cacao butter because unfortunately there's no food grade press up to at least January. I think someone might have started one now in Haiti, right. but there was no food grade press, so there was no way to press it, um, to use it. So we will use some organic one from Ecuador, from fine cacao. And, and thank you, Maria and Lee, if you're listening. And we also, there's no places that do also powdered milk. So for our powdered milk, it's imported milk because that's all we find in Haiti. But other than that, all our ingredient, where is the cacao, the sugar, and the lime and the soon to be orange and all the other flavor we're planning to do are going to be all ingredients from Haiti. When did you start the business? So, um, let, I started in 2015. So five years ago, we're celebrating our five, fifth year and our special, yes, it's like we have a saying in, Haiti, in Creole, Haitian Creole that says, cinq ans pas cinq jours, which means Five years is not five days. So we managed to make five years. So it's not five days. So it's important for us. So, right. yeah. Um, so what's your capacity now? Like how much chocolate, how much chocolate are you making these days? Uh, it depends. It depends. The capacity is as growing. It's a matter of like um, how much we can sell. First, how much we can sell in Haiti. How much can we export? So as we export, we are building our capacity. It's not like we are at capacity. It kind of like more of a pool system. So as we're like, as we need have more orders, we, we, we produce more. But I think at this one, we could produce up with the equipment as is, if we are going, we could produce between six to 12. So it really depends. Thousand six to 12 bars. Thousand. In okay. how, how long? Uh, so is that annual? Per week. Oh, no. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> No never, way. I, thinking, I, well, I, no, I thought maybe you were talking metric tons. Oh, okay. Yes. So, yeah. Well, then that's yearly. Yes. If you're talking metric ton, that's 12 tons. Yes. But no, we're talking about 12, 12, um, 12 to 16,000 bar per month. Got it. And so, I mean, but I mean, I understand, you know, you're an engineer and vertically integrated and Haitian chocolate, but, but why chocolate? I mean, if you, you know, you're going to open a business in, in Haiti, like, did you always have a love for chocolate? Like what's the, no. what's the draw? <laughs> no. The draw was, okay, when let's say like, so I was, so after I did my engineering degree and I got my MBA, I work as both an engineer and a consultant management. And I was having that fancy lifestyle, you know, going to Michelin star restaurant in New York, probably the Bernardin, Jean-Georges, you know, the life per se and all, having a life. And I was like, you know what? A lot of things got checked on my to-do list, like the education, the travel. By then, I, by then I was at 45 or 50 country visited. Now I'm at 65. But, but I felt like a lot of things on my to do list were checked, like travel, um, readings, visit, family time. And I'm like, you know what? What's missing is the business. So I decided, okay, what business I want to do. So when I was a teenager, I wanted not to give into charity and create a business. Now that I was in my late 20s, I was like, okay, I want a business that will create revenue for Haitian farmers because 60% of the Haitian population is actually subsistence farmers. Um, and the second, and I'll come back to that. The second was that it needed to create blue collar jobs because the stats are 4% of the Haitian population has a four year degree. So you had to create blue collar jobs because people can work with their hands. And the third, it shouldn't be in Port-au-Prince as you potentially saw in the news, the earthquake was in Port-au-Prince and a lot of things like was destroyed and a lot of things were concentrated in Port-au-Prince. We sometimes call it the Republic of Port-au-Prince. So I wanted a business that will be outside of Port-au-Prince, creating jobs blue collar for women because I'm the CEO, so I guess who I want to work with. And also, 
um, creating revenue for farmers because Haitian farmers are mostly, so they have a little bit of everything, but no market for most of their crops. So I started researching different crops, lime, lime mango, orange, vetiver. I said first about a juice plant and um, grape food, oranges and juices, but it was a million dollars. I didn't have this as safe saving. So when I got to cocoa, I realized that high end chocolate tea, like Bona, I'm sure you saw that bar by Bona that says Haiti, maybe, maybe that. Um, and also Valrona were using Haitian cocoa for their bars or for their couverture. And I'm like, well, if Bona is doing it with Haitian cocoa, I could do it in Haiti and have a finished product that says Haiti on it. And voila, we do have the product. So that's how I got started in cacao. Not because I was a chocolate lover, but mostly because I wanted to create something nice and delicious made in Haiti. So we were, we were talking a little bit about, about challenges in Haiti. Challenges. And Power and you were on generators and all yes, that stuff. Yes, and all about shipping here to the U.S. And then because it's a fragile product. And now it's more like getting it into more places like in the U.S. and North America. So we're focusing on the U.S. and Canadian market because, frankly, um, this is a fancy product. Very good for anyone, but fancy and expensive to make. So we need to find a market that is willing to, to pay for it. Right. And this is one of the challenge. Right. I mean, I think it's a challenge for, for I mean, the, the bean to bar market in general was, um, I mean, it, it's a growing market, but it, it, I think there's some price elasticity there and there, there's, there's challenges because it is an expensive product to source you know, on the cacao side, and then it, it's an expensive product to, like, produce. And ship. Um, and ship. I mean, and I think, you know, you were talking before about there aren't a lot of people producing at origin. I mean, there's a reason I, why. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a reason. <laughs> I mean, that for years, nobody was producing at origin. I mean, Calvo now is producing at origin because they're able to do some level of production and then move it, move it other places, right? Yes. Um, and I think that's that's part of the story, right? I mean, the, but but it doesn't answer that fundamental question about you know taking this 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 fragile product, right, that needs to be treated well, you know, at, at every step of the process, and then and then turning it into chocolate, which can't isn't not can't be, but isn't done inexpensively if you are not making a lot of it, right? I mean, there's definitely some some level of scale, right? I mean, if you're Barry Calvo, it's easier to make it less expensively. Definitely, definitely. Right. Um, so there's a volume to be made. So there's a lot of question like we get at least in Haiti where it's expensive. Well, it's expensive to make. So we have to make it in a way that at least we cover our costs. And even if we don't have the large margin that other company wants, but we have this need to cover our costs and get back our initial investment at least so right but um, i mean but also you're i mean the goal there too I, I i would feel is that you're trying to build something right and yes. you're trying to support both the farmers and and the people that work for you in your factory right so the Definitely. goal is not to i mean traditionally it's not to get extremely rich on it well right i mean i think unfortunately chocolate has been built on the back of the farmers yes, right i mean it is margins not all margins and not all chocolate companies. And, you know, I mean, I think there's, there's a reputation that everybody is not treating workers well. Um, and I think in the past that may be more true than today, yeah. I hope. Right. But I mean, the goal for your business is to, to treat people fairly. Well, yes. And then we can sell it already in the community where we go buy cacao and we pay almost seven price to the going rate. Of course, we pay seven times what? people are going to sell to like these wholesaler that get all type of different type of cacao that end up in MNMR. So this is not the same quality that we use. So right. we pay higher because we go get the pod. We, ex we, we do the, uh, we, we get the cacao beads out of it ourselves. We ferment and dry it ourselves. So we have a higher quality and that's how our cocoa beans were among the top 50 at the town of Chocolat at their last 2017 award when right. they do the cacao excellence this being said we know because we pay so much more we can afford to tell the farmers okay we pay you more so 
our farmers don't send out their kids. So because their kids or they can afford to send the kids to school, so they don't need to come and help. So we don't have child labor. So that's an improvement. And the, in the community where we go, they're like, okay, you know what, Kareen and team, James, Foodland Company, if you could help us get a better school with better teacher, that will help greatly. So they tell us what they need. So that's a difference we can make where because we bring money in the community, we can also help them improve the quality of life there and ask them what they need. And then, oh, they don't, we don't even ask. They tell us what they need. Right. You know, and I think that's, that's the movement. And I think that's one of the great things that, in addition to great chocolate. I mean, that's coming out of the bean to bar, the bean to bar movement throughout the world, not just in the U S or North America is yeah. this, this striving to improve lives on the ground, you know, in those, in those traditionally, poorer, you know, lesser developed places that are agricultural based economies. Exactly. Right. I mean, and that's, and that's, the difficult, I mean, and that's the difficult conversation about chocolate. It always is. Right. I mean, you know, that, you know, as, as a producer, you know, as somebody that works with chocolate all the time, we, we, we would like to see that be as value as it could be, but to make that more value means somewhere along the way, everybody's got to make less money and, the farmers who's making the least amount of money in that whole proposition anyway. Yeah. And, and the thing that I realize that if they don't make money in the long run, they're going to stop. So it's going to be a problem for us. And if they don't make money, their kids will not want to be that. Their kids want to, are going to want to be, you know what, that shitty life. I don't want it. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be an admin. I want to be anything else, but on this form where I'm not making money, I'm working long hours and I'm not even having a life and I'm in the middle of nowhere in the boondocks. So that's the other issue we run into. So if we cannot make it affordable and good, a uh, good investment for the farmers in the long run, they want, don't, they will not want to do it. And we're going to have to kind of reinvent the way we get our cocoa beans because there's a reason why it's child labor. It's because grown up people don't want to do it. All right, so you've won some awards. Yes. Right? You want to tell us about some of those awards that you won? Well, yes. So the One cocoa or two. Beans, yes, the cocoa beans were among the 50 at the Salon du Chocolat in 2017. That's a Taka Excellence Award. So we're pretty happy because we had just started the year before fermenting and drying. So it was kind of a, one of our, our first batch. So we're very happy about it. And we could say, yeah. And like we say in French, pour le coup de sève, le coup de gloire. So... It's some cone, some French seed. Anyway, and, <laughs> and then we also got the Entrepreneurship Award, um, not how they call it, the Sustainability Award at the Northwest Chocolate Festival for the quality of our work in the chocolate world from the tree to the bar for all these sustainable work, way we're working with the farmers, with our team, etc. Got and it. And that was 2017 too. Uh, Totally unrelated. How many languages? How many do you speak? Five fluent, one beginner. Oh, actually, In four fluent, one In middle. Okay, In so French, Haitian, Creole, since these are the first two. And okay. then when you when you start high school in Haiti, you usually learn English and Spanish because I mean Dominican Republic is next door. Everyone speaks Spanish and English because it's English. And then so my grandparents got at my grandpa got at some point a scholarship to go to Germany. And he went to my grandma and they came back, they spoke German, and then the kids were involved in it. So as the grandchildren, whenever they were wanted to speak as adult or he'd pre hide present or hide cake, they'll speak German. So I said, I said, you know what? I'm going to be learn German so I can be like the grown up. So in my last year of high school, I studied German so I could be like the grown up. And two years later, I ended up met, meeting a German. So I was like, you know what? That's actually helpful. So that will be the fifth language. And then I, I wanted to learn Mandarin. Ni hao, xie xie, wa shu. You lost me when very, you went beyond English. But I'm very um, basic beginner on that. Got it. So somebody asked a question, what kind of drying techniques are you using these days? Drying to dry the cacao? Mm -hmm. um, we have these big, um, so we have these like large, so after fermentation. The drying part, that's what you mean. Yes. Okay, so we have this big tent, like this big land. Hold on a second. How big would you call, say the tents are? The drying tunnel. 
Andreas. Okay, I need to start listening. The drying tunnel. We have, how big are the drying tunnels we have? Okay, so 30 meters long, 10 wide. We have two of these. And then we put the cacao and we actually rake them. So we rake them depending of where it's the beginning, the middle of the end of it. I think sometimes it's every 30 minutes, sometimes it's every 20 minutes, depending on what. So we have this big tunnel, the drying okay. tunnel, 30 meter by 10 meters. So I guess in fit, that will be, I'm not very familiar with the Sorry. English. Sorry. Sorry, 30 by 10 meters. <laughs> 300 square meters. If you say so. You're the engineer. I mean, I'm just, I'm just a cook. You know, I just, I just. Well, then you know up. what happened? Okay, so in the, we use a British system here in the U.S., but in Haiti, we use a French system. I mean, the metric system. But when you go to engineering school, they kind of force you to go into the metric system. So all my, most of my classmates were having issue, but that's what I started. So it's kind of like that that's big. I have that big lacuna, that that big miss where I never really got very familiar familiarize with the feet system. I just know the metrics because Haiti was metric, Michigan was metric, so I never learned the other one. But anyway, I'm a metric guy. I'm with you. I love the metric system. I, I'm like, I'm, I'm waving the flag that we should switch in the United States. <laughs> okay. You know, it's like 1976. I'm, I'm all on board for okay. the metric system. So, do you, so obviously, I mean, Haiti's home, but, but do you miss the U.S.? I mean, do you miss the time, or do you get to spend enough time here that you don't? I get to spend enough time here because I mean, one of the deal I made with my husband was that I shouldn't spend more than six months outside of Haiti, outside of home, New York. So I spent a, a fair amount of time here in the U.S. Um, and the other thing also is kind of this point. My team's been really great at doing the chocolate. I mean, they master it. They don't make like. I mean, when I'm in one, I'm in. I swear, like, it's just a vacation for me because I don't know anything. I don't do the chocolate. I don't help. I'm just sitting around, joking with the team, helping. I just help put in boxes. That's the only help I'll get. I'll put, we have cases of 12. That's the only thing they can let, have me do anyway because that's the only thing I can do. I cannot grind. I cannot pack. I cannot mold. I cannot temper. I'm bad at all these. So, which means that most of the thing I do is, like, mostly business development, meeting with you, doing presentation. I don't really do the chocolate. So you will not, I will not be the hands-on chocolate makers who know everything about the tempers, who knows everything about the molding, about, no, um, I'm not that one, unfortunately or fortunately. So I'm mostly like the, okay, how many boys will you cake? I mean, how many cases, et cetera. Right, right. So I ask everyone this question. This is like my, the, the one I've question I ask everyone. It. All right, so I'll let you go. Okay, so you're, you're up late studying at Michigan. You know, you you wander out to get you, you realize you need a bottle of water. There's not in your dorm fridge, so you go to the local Seven Eleven or whatever it is in Michigan. You go buy your bottle of water, and you're gonna buy a candy bar on the way back to the register. What candy bar do you buy? I don't think they have these <laughs> in Michigan. I have yet. I mean, I, I mean, in terms of chocolate bars from other vendors, I mean, other makers that I really like, I really like the coconut one um, by Raka there in Brooklyn. I'm sure you know it. See, you, you took this question to a whole other level. We're looking for your, like, your, your inexpensive mass market candy bar. I'll, I'll uh, tell you, I'm a, I'm a Kit Kat guy. No, I'll, I'm not. I buy I'm Kit so Kat sorry. Bar. I'm so sorry. Like, not an M&M, not like a gummy no. bear, nothing. Mm -hmm. The only thing I've been really liking are these little cheese thing that they have in in Trader Joe, and I haven't seen them anywhere. And they have some uh, how do you call that? Some truffle oil on them. Then again, I'm the you know I'm the girl who goes to Nougatine, Jean Georges, and Percy. <laughs> right. So I'm sorry, I'm pretty picky regarding. My no worries, it's all food. good. <laughs> So, no, so you would not find me we, buying get Kit Kat or any of these. Got it. Especially that I've never been a chocolate person, per se. So, But you did say candy. So, in terms of candies, or maybe these Wetter's Original. I really love them. Okay. This I could go back. Okay, Wetter's Original. Butters a butterscotch. So, you, yes, you're reaching the, for the butterscotch. Exactly. Right. That's, Wetter's cool. Original. That's an answer. We're going to write that down. We're going to put it in your press release now. We're going to, like, tell your marketing you team that. Yeah, I mean, it's really tasty. I can really, that's my favorite one. Since Got I it. was five years old, actually. 
All right. So this is that point where we tell you that you have the opportunity to plug anything you want. You can talk about your website. You can talk about your favorite bar. You can talk about anything you want to talk about right now. This is it. Okay. So my favorite how do we book... buy your How do we buy your products? That kind of stuff. Okay, my favorite bar is our brown sugar one. It's pretty special because it has autumnal cane sugar. Cane sugar hasn't been refined that we get directly from the farmers in Haiti. So it has a very much of a caramelized taste that you don't find in any, I mean, many other bars, almost no other bars. So it's going to be really special. Um, in terms of where to buy, it's easy as that. On our website, it's askanya.ht. It's a little bit like askanya, A-S-K-A-N-Y-A, dot H-T for Haiti. Um, but do not worry, it's not going to take forever to be delivered. We ship from our warehouse in Brooklyn, New York, so you don't have to wait for the bar to leave Haiti. So you're, pretty, you're going to be surprised. You might receive it within two to three days. Um, How many bars are you doing these days? How many bars are available on the site? Oh, but we have everything on stock now. But I mean, how many, different, how many different, different... Oh, different flavors. So we yeah. have five flavors. So we would have first our regular milk. That would be our regular milk. Um, that was our first flavor, 47% cacao. And we also, the second will be the brown sugar I was talking about with artisanal cane sugar. It's a 50% bar. So these two were our, our milk, I have milk into them. But right. they're more like dark milk than a milk, 4% cacao with a lot of milk and sugar and preservative. These are only natural ingredient, no preservative. And then we have our introductory dark at 60%. And then we have a dark with lime at 65 and we have a 90%. So we have five bars. As you can see, there's kind of missing that 65 to the 90. So we're coming with an 82% um, orange flavor shortly. And they're available on our website. And since we're celebrating our fifth anniversary, um, we are offering five bars for $5 each. So a minimum of five bars to get five. So five bars for 25. So that's a steal given that usually this bar for six, $7. So we're not going to be five every year. So next year, it might be $6 per bar. So you better take advantage of the five. <laughs> Inflation, all that good stuff. All that good stuff. And it's made to be like six for six. So you're kind of losing on the open. So go ahead, order, and we'll be more than happy to ship it for you. Awesome. And then we were joking yesterday. And you can that... also follow us on social media, Instagram and Facebook, Ascania Chocolate. Cool. And we were joking yesterday that I didn't have to, like, learn all your last names. No, like, that is so unnecessary. Current JSS, JSS was... It's perfect. <laughs> How do you end up with so many last names? So, up to when I was 10, I only thought I was Corinne Sanon. And then when I had to do my exam in Haiti, I had to bring my, my birth certificate, and I realized I had my mom's last name too, but it would go as my middle name, and I hated it. So when I came to college, I made sure that I was registered under Corinne Joachim Sanon. And then at some point I got married and it was Zimiet. And I was like, you know what? If I become Korean Zimiet, it's not going to sound Asian at all. It's going to lose it. <laughs> so I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to add it. So it's going to be Korean Joachim Sanon Zimiet. Um, so making everyone happy, mom, dad, and husband side, but making it super long for you, Brian. So Korean JSS, it's so much easier or just Korean. And then that makes it easier. So people call me Corinne instead of Madame. Like in Haiti, they like to go Madame, but it's better. Colleen. Yeah, they make fun of me around here that I like mispronounce words that I should know how to say. So like That's that, okay. would have, it would have been a disaster. So thanks for the help with the how to say Corinne Scania JSS. And Corinne <laughs> JSS like made my life way easier. So, You're welcome, uh, Brian. It's all about it. It's all about making life happy, fun, easy, having a good time. That's what Chaka is all about. Yeah. So the other thing that we said we were going to talk about yesterday when we did our pre-interview was, um, you know, we're looking at people differently in this country, right? I mean, at least in the U.S. And we, we talked a little bit about, you know, that, that the, the f chocolate, cacao, starts with, with 15 degrees north and south of the equator. And, exactly. And, and, and people that, that... Between the two tropics... That, Right. I mean, the people that look different than I do. I mean, there's not really another way to put it, right? Whether they're, whether they're Western From African, Vietnam, right? Or they're, and they're Indian. not, they're not, they're not they're looking like you. Yeah, they're, they're not white Hawaii. people. Well, in Hawaii, um, um, Daniel Odoarty looks like you, so you'll find someone. <laughs> right, but, but you know what I mean? Like, and I think that we, you know, we've, I think we're looking at race in the United States 
more than we have recently because of, you know, shitty reasons like uh, like putting it out there i mean like we're not looking at it because it's like good stuff we're looking at it because it's bad stuff and we're looking at you know systemic racism in the united states and you know as, as somebody that grew up in the lesser developed world right i mean which haiti is right yes and studied in the united states and you're kind of back and forth a little bit i mean and you know there's there's challenges that you must be presented as as a person of color running a business in the United States and running a business in Haiti and, oh, you know, and running a business, yes. Oh, yeah, I mean, that, that's a whole other I mean, thing. I mean, we, we talked with Jessica a couple of weeks ago from, from Harlem Chocolate Company in Brooklyn, and, and she said, you know, I've learned to navigate it. And I think, to me, that... Me too. It, it, but, but the fact that you have to navigate it is the problem, right? Like, I don't think if I were to talk to... I don't think if you're going to ask me about how I've gotten where I've gotten in my life, I'm going to say, well, I've had to navigate it. You know, like, no, I did. I That's took the privilege. path. I was <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, in a way, I, in a way, in a way. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 used, not... I think I used to not think that I was privileged and I, I would forget that I'm privileged just because I am right. Because I, I didn't grow up. You know, I'm privileged in a lot of ways. Like how many right. Haitian, if it's 4% of the population who has a four year degrees in Haiti and have one from university of Michigan and another one from what on the top school in the world for engineering and business, I am right. way privileged there. So it might be on a smaller pond, but I'm privileged. Right. But I mean, you, but you encounter things based on the color of your skin that That's I don't right. encounter. Right. I mean, in spite of having a degree from Wharton and a degree, a degree from, yeah. you know, oh, definitely, definitely Ann Arbor. Right. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I mean, I had a boss who told me once, like, I don't understand. You don't seem with all my degrees. You don't seem impressed by the fact that you're working with VPs. Um, and I'm like, I've worked with president. I mean, in my past, I've worked with the president of Haiti and your VP doesn't even have a four year degree. So why should I be impressed? I mean, in my head, but right. as a re you don't say that to people, period. <laughs> was it, do you think it was easier, though? I mean, is it easier to, to open a business in Haiti than it would have been in the United States? I mean, I'm not talking about, like, the logistics of Haiti being hard or not having power. I, I think not, but, but because... I think it would have been easier to open it in the U.S., definitely. I think, personally. Um, in terms of being closer to your market, in terms of being closer... To the logistic, then I'm thinking advantage. I mean, there are some advantages if you know where to search for minority businesses that I could have tapped into that I can't because my business is based in Haiti. Like a lot of people are like, oh, why aren't you taking the PPP loan? I'm like, I'm not based here, I'm based in Haiti. So it might have been easier. It would have been easier to get into larger brand store? Like, I mean, I was reading an article recently by Creole Lissons where she said, like, a lot of places where high-end, natural, good product will not accept her because she was, she didn't feel accepted because, um, because she's a black brand. And I'm like, yeah, maybe that would have been an issue for me, too, if I was based in the U.S., where big retailer may not have been, might have been reluctant to get me. And the, the fact is, I'm not in a big retail, like, I'm not in... I'm not, I'm not in key food, I'm not in whole food, and I'm not in, um, I'm not in any of these big places where, or, I don't know, somewhere else, um, didn't know the world got closed, so that's not a good example at this point, but places that hang in chain, that would be a good place for us, because our product fits all the
category were natural ingredient, good for you, making a difference. And we're not there. And it's not because we haven't tried, we haven't contacted, but we haven't received an answer. So maybe that would have been, that's an issue. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what the next steps for our industry are to, to fix that, right? I mean, other than, I think we have to talk about it. Right. I mean, we have to we have to start that conversation and not be afraid to have the conversation. And I think, you know, you, you said yeah. before, you know, hey, Brian, you're privileged. And it's sort of like my initial reaction is, no, no, how no, dare you should she? See, you should, <laughs> no, no, I'm not how dare she. But like, you should see my friends. My friends are privileged. Right? Like, I, I grew up, I mean, I grew up in Philadelphia. I went to I went to, you know, an all boys private school that was around for hundreds of years. And, you know, my parents weren't paying the whole thing. And so like the difference between my friends and me made me feel, well, I'm not privileged. Like those are the privileged people. Yeah, I know, yeah. Right. And, and I think like that's exit type of high school. Right. But I mean, I think, and so in my head, like I can justify, Hey, I'm not a privileged guy. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's when we take the time to really have a frank conversation about race that I got to realize that I'm privileged. Like yeah. whether I want to think that way or not, you know, and, and I think that's where, I guess that's where my question's coming from. I mean, there, there, are, there are challenges because you opened in Haiti, but there would have been different challenges if exactly. you opened in the United States. I mean, in Haiti, you don't look, di I mean, you, you don't, don't look, look different. as different, yeah, no, no. right? So as like a business, local, yes, right. And, very and much. so if someone's going to open a business, you're going to open very, The minority, like the business and the rich Haitian also, that's the thing that they're also really light skin. So me being like, like your regular girl in the sense that I'm really black, I'm not light skin. So I'm not going to appear like I can take public transportation and anything. And I'm not going to look like weird compared to maybe a lighter skin person. So, I mean, we have our issue too, granted, but for me to start a business, that was possible. And again, I'm a minority of Ken, because if you think that the GDP in Haiti is $800 and just to open a business, it costs you I mean, to register a business $2,000. So if someone on average make $800 a year and you ask them to pay $2,000 to just register the business, you're never going to have any registered business. Like people are just going to be saying the shady. So again, I'm another, another minority or privileged one in the sense that I can do something right. I can follow all the rules and still, and I had to in order to get all the products to the U.S. anyway, but I can follow all the rules and that's a privilege that a lot of Haitians don't have. So there is issue both ways. But I'm aware of the fact that here there's other issue in the sense that also the Af African-American, the Black community, the Black population is 15%. And if you would have expect like at least about 15% of the, of the brands, of the product in the stores of the of anything to be African American. That's not the fact. Like most company and even the big name, they own they have less than four percent or two percent of black brands on their shelves. So that's something that needs to be revalued and reassessed. And it's because we're putting the light on it right now. I mean even at Wharton when I was there, it was like we were not ten percent like the black people population. And a lot of us were even foreign student coming from Africa, from the Caribbean. And I'm like, right. so if we're not even 10% of the population of Wharton, and most of us are like foreign kids, where are the real African-American? They're not getting the degree. Right, in, in West Philadelphia. And in right. West and, Philadelphia. And, right, which, I mean, my friends tell the story. And I have, I have a friend that went from where I went to school in Philadelphia to, to Penn, you know, for his undergraduate degree mm -hmm. as, as an African-American. And this is 30 years ago, you know, so, I mean, you know, and at the point in time where Penn, that part of West Philly had not been gentrified and was still, was still not the best of neighborhoods, right? No. I mean, and it's still not great, but I mean, it, it's better than it was 30 years ago. And I mean, you don't go past three blocks from Wharton anyway. Yeah. So right. I mean, but, but you, you really did it in 1990. But, you know, I mean, I think where he, you know, as a person of color, you know, his friends would, you know, use him sort of as like that person they could go out into the, into the city with. Right. And, you know, he experienced, you know, a really different experience than what the average person of color was experiencing in West Philadelphia. Right. Because he was that 10% at Penn at the time. And you're right. He, you know, he was actually an American and that, that wasn't the common 
that wasn't the common thing black for a person. person of color. Yeah. For a black, yeah, for a black person at Penn in, in 90, they were not from the United States. They were not in the United States, and up to now, and, and I was in 20, I graduated in 2011, so yeah. It's right, like, and so, and, and, and I guess that's, the, that's kind of the same kind of conversation is it's like, so why not? You know, are we, because we're, because, because there aren't smart people? No, because, because that pathway not, doesn't, yeah, seem, they're not that, prepared that, for that. That pathway doesn't seem available, right? And, and those are things that I think, you know, it, hearing your story, it's like, okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to, we're going to improve the lives of, of, of farmers, you know, and, and, We've, we've got to do I all think of it closer at once, to right? us, like, and I think, like, even I, I, I mean, we need to make a conscious effort. Like, for me, even for me, I mean, I didn't buy that much black before, and I'm making a conscious effort to do. Like, for instance, like, I had to order my soap, and I tried to look for African American brand, and I have to order my toothpaste. I mean, you know, I made a conscious effort. You know what? I'm going to support good product, but made by African American. It takes a, a black company. And it takes a little bit more effort, a little bit more research, but that's helping. And I think that if 1% of or 4% of the population does that, we're, 30, we're 300 million Americans. So if 1% of us do that, that's going to be a lot of sales for this company. And that's going to kind of reverse because if we get more sales, we can hire more people. Like even with that Black Lives Matter, my sales have increased. So I can keep my employees employed and I can even hire more. And that has like that snowball effect. But I need 1% of the population to think like this, you know, or 4% right. of the population to think like this. Like when they, their sales are smaller than it is or as big as it is, it's making a difference. And the same way I'm sure my sales to that African-American, Black American, and want to end up being Haitian without even me knowing, um, my sales are helping their sales. Like you buying from me and you making an effort and it doesn't have to be everything like it can be okay you, you you're conscious that your coffee or your goods or whatever like 10 percent or 15 percent of your sales come from minority whether it's a black company whether it's an african-american a white com i mean a women company a lgbt company you know but you're supporting these companies that are less visible and have less opportunity than the big name brand and that's gonna and as more people buy like this that's gonna potentially uh probably hopefully bring the interest of the buyers who are willing to take a chance because as you have more sales then you have a better supply chain you have better ways because if i get more sales i can hire that container that full container and get all my chocolate in container from the u.s and then don't have to deal with the issue of supply chain that I'm dealing with now because right. I have enough sales, but until I get there. So we need each of us to make an effort. Like, it's not, like okay, what am I buying that's made by a black company? That an African American, right. and they're a good product. It's not like all oh, these not shitty products. They're all excellent products that are working. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, uh, I think, you know, in, my, in our house and one of the conversations, it, it's not enough for me to say, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to teach my daughter to be different, right? I mean, or to, to, to recognize differences and not, not to overlook that and yet not to treat people differently because of whatever that orient, whatever that, whatever that gift they were given at birth is or that orientation or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we have to have the, the conscious awareness of it. Like, I think that 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 concept change it's like i'm not going to ignore it i'm not going to be colorblind of course because being colorblind is part of the problem it's also a problem right it's like i can't just be colorblind like that that it doesn't work that way because by being by by in my head being colorblind means that i'm then going to ignore when things happen to people of color right whether that's that's you know that's kind of the other version of going from all lives matter black lives matter is colorblind you know it's kind of like all these Right, because, because, because all lives matter doesn't mean that injustices are happening to to blacks in this country, right? And I think that's that's where that is. Yeah, that's the problem with that kind of statement. But anyway, so we're kind of getting close on time. Um, I know we had a little hiccup there, but just so everybody knows, we are gonna our marketing team has already put up that they're gonna edit this all together in one place and put it on our YouTube page in a, in a week or so. Excellent. So it, it'll all be there, um, and. Uh, you know, you've already done your plugs and all that stuff, but Escania chocolates and order the five dollar deal right now for five five year anniversary, right? Yes, and also I wanted to show you 
we use some of the turmeric molds for our chocolate for baking. I don't know if you recognize this mold. I do recognize that mold. That's a, that's a beautiful mold. Thank you. Yes, it's our turmeric mold because um, for the baking, that's the one we use. I don't have it with me right now, but I do have the chocolate we use with the turmeric mold. And we're very happy. My team really likes it. So When you grow, we're going to get you one of these. The next time you grow, we're going to get you in selling equipment. Yes. But does Tomrick do sell me too? Or do, are you a data distributor of Sony? We're the, yep, we okay, are. That's good. I mean, you yeah, talk to me. I mean, if you yeah. don't like the pricing, you call me. We'll, we'll get that okay, all Okay, I don't like out. the pricing. Okay, now I'm saying it live. I don't like the pricing. I want it now. Nobody likes the pricing. But it's a <laughs> premium product. Nobody likes the pricing of your chocolate know, either. It's, but like it's a chocolate? premium product. It's a, okay. premium, it's a premium product. It's my favorite. Like, you, know, like, you know like when someone has a favorite car, like a favorite car they want to ever buy? Well, that's me. The sell me tempura. I think it's called Aura. Uh, is it called? The, there's the a small, plus. There's the, well, the that plus. one's a one. The one's the one right and the plus. And a and color all. over there. Yeah. Yes, I think your next my, your next expansion. Yeah. Your next expansion. Expect. We're 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 on the team. We'll figure it out, and yes. I'll come down and do the. We'll we'll help with the uh, installation. Oh, you have to. You have no choice. We'll see what we can do. Hey, uh, Corinne, thanks a ton for Thank spending some so time much. with us this afternoon. And um, appreciate it. It was a great conversation. Yeah, it was and, a great conversation. Sorry and we're now we're friends. Up, but yeah, so we, we are. Whenever. Yes, we can, definitely. You should come to Buffalo next, you know, when you want to go to Toronto. Buffalo. <laughs> you miss the snow? No, you don't no, miss No, I snow. don't. I mean, there's no snow now. It's summertime. I mean, we're up. We had snow Mother's Day this year, though. So that oh, was May. Really? Yeah, Oops. So. Okay. 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 Anyway, Perfect. Corinne, thanks so much for joining Thank us. Thank we'll, you. Uh, we'll talk and soon, enjoy, all right? Enjoy your weekend. Bye. You too. Bye.